Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Responsibility Quotient Podcast. My name is Catherine Kowalczyk, and I'm happy that you're here today. It is April the 11th, 2024, and um, well, you know, the world is not getting any easier or better, it seems, these days, but I don't know if you know much about my background, and some of you will know a little bit about my background, but uh, I uh, ran in the last provincial election here in Alberta with the Independence Party of Alberta, and so I have a very keen interest in the topic that we are going to be speaking about tonight with Nadine Wellwood, and that is the Alberta Pension Plan. And I firmly believe that uh, it's in Alberta's best interest to uh, take back control over everything. And that includes, most importantly, our finances. And I also believe that there is no way that Alberta is going to get a foothold over Ottawa and what um, the federal government is doing to Albertans unless we do have the control over our finances. And Starting and taking back control over our um, pension plan is one way that we can do this. And I'm excited to speak to tonight with uh, Nadine Wellwood. I met Nadine a few years ago uh, through the chaos of COVID. And uh, Nadine is um, bright. She is tenacious. She has a passion for truth. I believe, and accountability and justice. And she's not afraid of the limelight herself. She's um, run in uh, a few elections, and I'll let her talk to you about that herself. Um, but she is a, a chartered investment manager with a background in aerospace and defense, which is quite interesting to me, and has carved out a niche for herself as a leading figure in the realms of financial planning, political consultancy, and personal coaching. She lives in Cochrane with her husband and her daughter. So without further ado, and so we can get as much information as we possibly can about why Alberta should uh, have its own pension plan and leave the uh, Canadian pension plan, is Nadine Wellwood. Nadine, welcome to the Responsibility Quotient podcast. Thanks for joining us. Oh, it's so good to be here with you, Catherine. Thank you so much. And all that tenacious and accountability and a passion for the truth. I know somebody of like mind who uh, I'm looking at on the screen right now who fits that bill quite well. <laughs> oh, well, you're very, very sweet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I was... Um, you know, when I first met you, Nadine, it, I think it was in Red Deer and we were trying to, you know, we were all kind of, you know, figuring out um, a, a group of us was figuring out basically, you know, how can we as Albertans get more autonomy? And um, it was with an organization um, that had um, really an idea of becoming an independent nation for sure. But um, I just recall your passion um, for people and for the issues. And so um, I'm really happy that you're here and, and you've, you've created this project now. Um, you know, Danielle Smith, a while back, uh, announced or delivered a report uh, that indicated that um, it would be financially beneficial for Alberta to pull out of the Canada Pension Plan. And of course, you know, everybody freaked out because, you know, of the rhetoric that was coming from all sides, mostly the left, and that they um, were afraid that obviously, um, well, not obviously, but they were afraid that, you know, uh, they were going to lose everything by uh, pulling out of the Canada pension plan and that it was going to be detrimental to Albertans. And um, which I, I really found interesting and I'm really actually perplexed by this because, you know, before COVID had you asked anybody whether or not they trusted our government, they all would have said no. And I, you know, and, and that went for probably the Alberta government, but also the federal government as well. And then I don't know if COVID had the result of, you know, hypnotizing people to a certain extent and paralyzing them in fear and all of a sudden deciding that they thought that the 
Canadian government was this, you know, the best thing for Albertans, the best thing for Canadians and that they knew best. And we should put all of our faith and trust in, in our governments. But that's kind of what the impression has been with me regarding the public's reaction to this in Alberta, um, especially, I guess, from the left. So to me, I don't see why people in Alberta would think that the Canadian government is able to manage something like the Canadian pension plan any better than the Alberta government would. Anyway, I, you know, I have questions about both of them. But, um, you know, with all the scandals, with the misappropriation of money that the federal government, especially the Trudeau government, is um, is mired in right now, you would think that people would want a, a, a different solution. And so what was disappointing to me about the announcement or how this has played out, you know, although Daniel Smith has done these uh, telephone consultations with people all around Alberta, they kind of just left it. And, you know, I would have thought that she, she should have taken the bull by the horns and just legislated it and, and taken Alberta out of the Canadian pension plan and started the Alberta pension plan. But I I want this show to be about you and your and your presentation. You've been crisscrossing all of Alberta, trying to educate people about what the benefits are, what the risks are of leaving the Canada Pension Plan and and um, starting the Alberta Pension Plan. So I really want to turn this over to you um, to get you to educate people out there about the risks and the benefits. Well, thank you. That's uh, you, you've hit on a lot of the key issues, um, a big one being trust in the government. And it's funny because if I had to pick two of the, the major themes as I've crisscrossed the province, um, the first one is a lack of trust in the government and the provincial government in particular. And you're absolutely right, because, you know, we're trusting a government, whether it's the federal government or the provincial government, you kind of have to pick your poison a little bit. And the reality, however, is that at a provincial level, at least you can, as an Albertan, take even like I live in Cochrane, as you pointed out, I can take a three hour drive to Edmonton, go stand on the steps of legislature and demand to see uh, Premier Smith. And chances are I would probably get an audience. Um, but I can't do that with the federal government. And we saw that with even the Freedom Convoy. You know, you, you take your chances. Not only do you not get an audience, you may get yourself arrested. So, you know, if you have to choose between one government and another, you've got far greater an opportunity, I think, to influence politically a government that's a little closer to home uh, than you do one that's centralized in Ottawa, especially for Albertans. And we've seen again and again and again, um, the federal government is extremely hostile towards Alberta, not only, you know, with environmental issues, but with lots of other economic policies, mm -hmm. um, the carbon tax. I mean, and, and it's not just Albertans that are suffering. I mean, all of Canada right now is suffering because of the economic policies and the failed immigration policies. And I could go on and on that the federal government has, um, especially this liberal federal government. Um, and now I'm not going to limit it just to them because I could go back to early 2000s and talk about some of the follies and the mistakes that governments have made all the way through. But this Trudeau government in particular has just, I think, really bought to the limelight, the pain and the mistakes that have been made. And it's hard for people because they don't see the consequences often to the actions taken um, immediately. Sometimes a policy is, is sounds really lovely. Like, for example, the one government today uh, is going around promoting, well, they're going to put build houses, you know, another $15 billion here and another $8 billion there. And it's like, well, for one, where's that money coming from? But for two, um, you can't build those homes fast enough to have any significant impact for the people who need them today. So, you know, we got all these Band-Aid solutions constantly economically that are political in nature, 
not solving the problem, but actually usually exasperating the problem, making them worse and or kicking them down the road so that it becomes the next government's problem. So that's the problem with politics in general is it's never the, the, the government of today's problem. You know, their only concern is getting reelected. You know, they're not overly concerned as it's, it appears with, you know, spending money they don't have. They're not overly concerned with economic policy. They're more concerned about buying a vote and getting themselves reelected. And unfortunately, that always comes at the expense of the taxpayer. And in this particular case, um, and it, it's no different uh, today than it was then, especially with this Alberta pension plan, this is such a unique opportunity for Albertans to get out of a failing system, in my opinion, um, and do something better uh, for Alberta. And, you know, hopefully by the end of tonight, you know, your audience will have seen just uh, the advantages there are in an Alberta pension plan. And what I do is I try to focus on the risks as they are known with the Canada pension plan and how Alberta is just in such a better position to mitigate those risks due to the uh, inherent advantages that we as Albertans have over the rest of Canada. So I want to ask you something just because I, I want to, um, and this is more kind of a per more personal in nature, but what is your affiliation with the current government? Do you have an affiliation? Um, because, and I asked that question just because I, I want to, I, I think I know the answer to it, but I want to um, kind of reassure uh, the audience here that you're not being paid by the government. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, this isn't, this isn't something that, that, you know, you're doing at their invitation or their request. You're a private citizen. And as far as I am aware, you decided that this is something that you feel so passionate about and you believe in so much that you are investing your own time, your own money, your own resources in order to bring this information to Albertans. Do I have that correct? So I have no affiliation with the government whatsoever. Um, if anything, uh, you know my story as it relates to the United Conservative Party. And I did run <laughs> for the uh, position candidacy for MLA down in Livingston McLeod and actually won that. Um, my name was put forward to be the candidate, the name on the ballot for the last uh, provincial election. And of course, the UCP executive saw to it that um, that was not gonna happen and pull the rug out completely from underneath me. So I definitely do not have um, any loyalty or any you know, uh, sense of duty or obligation to any of the government, um, whether it's you know Premier Smith herself or MLAs or a party. I've always acted in the best interests of Alberta. So even when I ran for the People's Party of Canada, um, I ran for the People's Party of Canada, why? Because they have the best policies. They have the absolute best policies and the best platform that I have seen. And it's always amazed me that how Albertans here in Alberta are so stuck on voting for a particular party um, that we, we actually do, I think, more harm to ourselves sometimes because instead of voting for the right person to do the job, somebody who's qualified, capable, and competent, we'll often just, you know, vote for a party leader. And, you know, we just end up with... Oh, I, 100%. I, I saw that. Sorry, Tindra. I saw that on the campaign trail for sure. We would be... I, I ran in Old Stidsbury Three Hills. And when I would be meeting people at the doors... And I asked them who they were thinking of voting for. They, you know, they would say the leader of the party. And and we would remind them that, of course, you know, that's not who you're actually voting for ultimately. But um, I would agree with you about the um, PPC federally for, right. you know, they've certainly come out with some really strong conservative um, policies that I could get behind. And I agree with you that, you know, instead of voting for the best person for the job, uh, really what we're what we're, we're what we're doing is we're keeping ourselves stuck in this rut of the this uniparty system with the illusion that we have choice. Uh, but I don't want. I mean, I could go on and on about this issue because I mean, 
I'm personally affected by it, not not just as um, as a citizen of Alberta, but also as a former candidate. So, uh, but I don't want to take up all the airtime about this because we have really important information. Um, but I just wanted the audience to know your background and like, kudos to you. I mean, I, I don't know if I would have had that much that much ambition to do what you're doing. So, you know, good job um, with that. But let me know what you want, where you want to start. Sure. Well, I mean, for a lot of people, I think it's truly just a matter of understanding. Uh, so just on, on, for me, my credibility comes from um, the fact that I am a chartered investment manager. So I have worked in finance for two decades and I have owned my own uh, private investment securities firm. So, um, you know, people talk about how complicated this is. I know all the moving parts. Um, I've been working in this space for a very long time. And yes, for somebody on the outside looking in, it looks like a, this insurmountable obstacle. But from somebody who's worked inside the space for the last you know, 20 years, there's nothing here that's insurmountable. And what some people are focusing on that they think is such a complex, complicated or, um, you know, challenge to overcome, I look at it and go, yeah, no, that's a pretty easy one to overcome. So, you know, just understand that there's a lot of uh, misconceptions and a lot of things that you don't understand, a lot of moving parts, I get it. But at the same time, for somebody who's worked in the industry, that's not usually a problem. It, things take time. Um, and there's a, a right way and a better way to do things um and there's wrong ways obviously to do things as well but nothing as far as an alberta pension plan goes is insurmountable and hopefully by the end of the night um, i do make it very clear in my own opinion that um, the alberta pension plan is the best thing for albertans and i say that as an independent individual a citizen who has a daughter who's 12 years old who alberta is my home and i see alberta as the last real stronghold uh, the beacon, the model that the rest of Canada should be looking towards um, to maintain its prosperity, its autonomy, and its freedoms. And so that's why I continue to stay in the fight and do what I do, because um, if not me, then who? And if not now, when? And, uh, you know, we need to be the change that we wish to see happen in the world. So we can't just sit at home and hope that somebody else is going to take care of it for us. We have to get out there and do it ourselves. And if that means that, you know, it takes time, I, I had to sit down with my daughter and my husband and go, hey, I'm going to go do this. Are you OK with it? That's I'm not going to be home a lot. So my dad, my husband right now is, you know, dad and 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 chauffeur and cook yeah. and works full time, you know, while I'm off, you know, traveling around the province. So it's uh, it has it's not easy on anybody. Um, and, you know, a lot of my support comes from personal donations. Um, I had hoped and it was a couple of bigger organizations that were going to fund some of this activity. Um, it's always amazes me that things never work out as they're supposed to or as planned, but that's okay. You just pivot and we keep moving forward. So, um, if you want tonight, one of the pl best places I find to start is, um, understanding what the Canada pension plan actually is. And so I did send you some slides. Uh, one of them does. Do you, want me to, do you want me to pull them up? Yeah. Do you want to pull up the CPP versus APP one there? Yeah, there you, you bet. Yeah. Okay, that I'm one. just gonna let. Oh, put your pretty face back up there. Don't, oh, okay. Don't leave me oh, okay. By myself. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you'll you'll have lots of things you'll want to comment on, but for for a lot of people, you know, they honestly believe what the government tells them 100. percent And and for many many years, why would we ever have doubted that? Right. So this is a new concept for people is trying to question, um, you know, why the government do does what they do and what, you know, when the government says something to not necessarily take it at face value. So what is the Canada pension plan? Is it truly a pension plan? Like if you were to think of a pension plan for yourself, what would that look like? You know, a retirement savings plan, you know, that you put money into. Yeah. And then yeah. You know, when it comes time for retirement, you could go access how much you needed, when you needed it. And, you know, it, it would be there. And if there's any leftover, you could probably give it to your spouse or your kids, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's not the Canada Pension Plan. And it was never, ever, ever set up that way. The Canada Pension Plan is actually a payroll tax. 
And um, even in 1997, when they bought in the Canada Pension Plan Investing Board and they changed the, the way that the Canada Pension Plan was set up, the infrastructure, they actually had to go to the Income Tax Act to make changes in order to allow that to happen. Why? Because it's a tax. And it's worse than a tax from a standpoint of, um, you know, you're taxed and then you get a benefit this way or that way. This is a pay-as-you-go system. It's not the money is put in and the money that you're putting in today gets invested. And that money, you know, compounds and grows over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Every dollar that you are putting in today is actually going to pay for somebody who's already retired. So it's used, right away, it's used right away, right? Absolutely. absolutely. And so is is that kind of like a Ponzi scheme? Well, if you define what a Ponzi scheme actually is, an investor gives you a dollar today and you, you walk it across the street and give it to the investor who gave you a dollar yesterday. Um, because it's the government, they don't call it a Ponzi scheme. It's called pay as you go. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> but, but you're not you're not incorrect. Um, but, but it is a tax, and and it's a very harmful tax from the standpoint of when this first started. Think about it. It started. There was 1.8 percent is what you paid into the Canada Pension Plan, and today we are at 11.9 percent. So today's generation of workers are paying a mm. lot more to fund the retirees who have paid a lot less to fund generations of retirees ahead of them. So it's getting more and more expensive and more and more costly to this younger generation that's now being asked to fund retirees that have benefited um, a lot longer and will see much greater returns and much greater financial security than they themselves will. So it is a pay as you go. It is, there is a pool of assets. In 1997, they did make a change. Um, instead of just a pay as you go and then investing in, in provincial bonds and things like that, they set up an investing board because they actually recognized it was unsustainable. And at that time, they predicted the money, the pay as you go scheme would be up and uh, by 2015. So they knew they had to make a change to it. And what they did was establish the CPPIB. They started collecting more in contributions. They reduced some of the benefits and they started investing the surplus. And that surplus today is now 590 billion in the assets under management by CPP investments. But there's two components to the CPP because there was another change that was made just this year. When LifeWorks had initially done their report, uh, the amount of contributions between the employer and employee was 9.9%. Today, that amount is 11.9%. And we also have an enhanced CPP, which is an additional 4%. And so that life, the that life, just a second, that LifeWorks report was the report that launched this whole topic for Danielle Smith. Is that correct? Yes. And yeah. it's really interesting because that LifeWorks report is what the NDP has come out and said, the numbers are fake, they're not real, um, the report is basically hogwash. But the reality is LifeWorks was actually Morneau Chappelle. Now, the Morneau part of that is Bill Morneau, who was mm. the liberal finance minister. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure he went back and double checked, triple checked and quadruple checked his numbers because I'm sure he himself probably was a little shocked to find the fact that Alberta was entitled to $334 billion, according to the formula in the Canada Pension Plan Act um, in Section 113 2A. So but I'm sure, you know, as the prior liberal finance minister um, it's the only actuarial report that has been done to date. And so for somebody to just completely dismiss it, and if you go to an NDP meeting, they'll tell you, oh, don't even bother reading the report. Like, that's right. just ridiculous. You know, I mean, right. you need to understand where they're getting the information and the facts from. It is factual. They use the stats, Canada data. They use the information that came from Canada and from reliable sources. Actuaries are very, very good at what they do. I mean, I'm sure you understand that. I mean, insurance companies use actuaries. And, yeah. you know, insurance companies are only profitable because they understand the data. 
They understand the facts and they understand the statistics, right? That's always what they're playing against. And so, you know, to say that uh, LifeWorks was inaccurate or just fake numbers is just plain wrong. Um, but getting back to the Canada Pension Plan. And, and just let me know when you want me to bring up, bring up the slides again, okay? And which slides to refer to. Sure, sure. Well, I'm still going to talk to that last slide. It is the Social okay. Benefit Program. And uh, the benefit program, it was actually tied to the social insurance number. So in 1966, this wasn't the only thing that came out. The social insurance number was put into place. And in order to entice people to sign up for the social insurance number, they had to dangle a little carrot called the social, uh, the Canada Pension Plan was the carrot that they chose to dangle. Um, so it's also a government owned asset. People go, well, it's my pension plan. Don't touch my pension plan. It's not your pension plan. Uh, let's be very clear about that. You can't go in and pull out no. the money that you want. There's no money there for you, in fact, um, very, very little. And the intention at the time was to reduce poverty. And it was a very poor vehicle um, for reducing poverty because if you don't contribute, you don't work. Right. And you're not contributing to a Canada pension plan. Well, then you don't receive anything. Right. You don't get anything from the Canada pension plan. So if you they were sincere yeah. about reducing poverty, they should have used the old age security OAS, not right. the Canada pension plan. And the government can change the rules anytime they wish. Right. Um, you know, they've increased uh, contribution rates and they've decreased uh, benefits. Why? Because they have no choice. It's a broken system. It's failing and they have to continue to increase contribution rates and or decrease benefits and or increase the number of people contributing to it um, in, or decrease the number of people who are benefiting from it in order to fix the problems um, the way that it currently stands. The maximum contribution you can make today is $8,110. Um, and that's between you and your employer, employer split 50-50. But the maximum benefit that you will ever receive, the maximum, supposing you put in every penny that you could, maximum contribution for as long as you can, is $1,365 a month. And yeah, most I, people don't even receive that. They receive on average about $832 a month. And how how is it that they decided that that's that's the amount I, I mean the the one thousand dollar amount i mean that's barely enough to do really a heck of a lot of it, anything really so um like what's the do you know the thought process behind this low amount uh, is it is it what's behind that well, the intention when the CPP was established was that it would replace one third of your income. Um, now, I mean, the thing is, is you've been contributing to, to this for 40 years. So, you know, your income early on is not going to be the same as your income later on in life, but it is indexed to inflation. So when this first est was established, I mean, you have to remember, it went from zero to all of a sudden you were getting a pension like the next year if you right. signed up for it in 1966. So there was no funds, no reserves, nobody had been contributing to it for years before it started. It literally on that pay as you go, took the money out of the pocket of the workers of the day to offer up to retirees. Um, and so when they established a number, they just established the number back in 1966 and they've been adjusting to inflation um, ever since. And of course, they've added some benefits. And of course, they've had to reduce some benefits over the years. So um, if you can find any logic as to why and how the government does anything, I'm all ears. I would love to hear it. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's just a result of where things started and where they currently uh, reside. And I'll show you okay. here shortly, they can't even afford that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's got a tremendous number of unfunded liabilities, which we'll talk to um, in a little bit. So from here, if you want to bring up the next slide, um, I, I like to tell people, you know, if the government takes a dollar from you, that's a dollar less that you have to either clothe your kids, put food on the table, send them to hockey, like in those early years, which are a priority. And, um, you know, or... A that a, it takes a dollar away from you that you could have put into your own private savings plan, right? Now, if you and your employer matched, um, like they do for the Canada Pension Plan, that 
$8,110, that's today's rate. That goes up next year to $8,848 as a maximum, by the way. But this year it's $8,110. Divide that by 12, that's $676 a month. So you and your employer, like let's say it was an individualized pension plan and you were contributing to it, you would put in half, your employer would put in half. Let's say you put that in at the first day of each month. And then for 45 years, you start at the age of 20 and you retire at the age of 65. Let's say it earns a modest 5% rate of return. Now people go, oh, come on. How am I going to earn 5% rate of return? If you had just put your money into the S&P 500 over the last 50 years, the historical rate of return has been 11.13%. So I think that realistically people could achieve 5% rate of return. Okay. If you had done that, that's $1.3 million that you would own, control, have, could pass down to your kids, your wife, your spouse, your husband, whomever you give to charity if you wanted. Um, you know, it, you're in full control. If you want to travel more be at 65 because you're young and active and healthy, you've worked a hard life, now you want to enjoy a little more time, you know, you can pull a bulk of it out and do that. that. You could give it away or, and you know, then take less in later years. You have full 100% control over that money. It's yours to do with as you please, right? You've only contributed $365,000. The rest is compounded interest, right? And Einstein compound interest uh, called it the eighth wonder of the world. Um, certainly it is. As you can see here, 965,000 of that is interest. That's your returns that you've earned on your contributions year over year. Now, if you take that $1.3 million and you want to turn it into an annuity, let's say that guaranteed lifelong income where you're never going to run out of money, right? Yeah. I'm um, making yeah. some arguments for people going, well, that's what the CPP is. No, that's not what the CPP is. But let's let's tackle that argument head on. If you had $1.3 million, you could walk that into any financial institution. They would turn that into an annuity for you. You could live on $8,000 a month for 20 years without running out of money. So at the age of 85, you would run out of money. Now you go, okay, I wanna plan a little better. I'm gonna to go to, to 95. That's 30 years, that's $6,200 a month. For six for 30 years, um, you'd run out of money at 95. That's a far cry from $1,365, the maximum that you could get at CPP. Now, the maximum you get with CPP, if you took that, that's $16,376 basically um, a year. If you took that and let's say at the age of 85, right, where would you be at? You haven't even, you're, you're, you haven't gotten your contributions back yet. Between what you and your employer have put in, you would have to live to the point of 85 years and six, well, basically 85 and two thirds of a year just to get your contributions back. Now, mm -hmm. the government is very good at stats. They know the data. And at the age of 83, which is the average life expectancy of a Canadian today, you've only received $295,000 back of the contributions that you and your employer have put in. So, you know, if you had done this yourself, you'd have far greater control. You'd have far more money. Um, and it's yours to do with as you please. And it's quite doable, even at a 5% rate of return. Okay. All right. Do you want to move on to yes. your next slide? Sure. So, you know, for me, it's about understand the risk. So we, I've already shown people now what they could have done if they had this money and had done it themselves. Now, why, why would you stay with the Canada Pension Plan? So for so many people, they're staying with a Canada Pension Plan because it's what they know, right? They receive a check every month, so they think it works. But what happens one day when the check doesn't come, right? And why why would why wouldn't it come? Well, at some point here in the future, and we're going to talk about this on a future slide. The again, like in 1997, they made a change, noting that come 2015, this the game was over, right? Because the their contributions, they weren't bringing enough in to fund the pay-as-you-go system, right? There was too many, too few workers to fund too many retirees. Well, we're there again in 2026. 
the expenditures will once again exceed the contributions in 2026. So the pay as you go system no longer works. So now they're going to have to dip into that $590 billion, uh, billion dollars of assets that the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board has been managing. And so that's a huge risk because there's also significant unfunded liabilities uh, with the Canada Pension Plan. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, okay. But the, the 31st Chief Actuarial Report, which is the auditing body of the Canada Pension Plan, it audits it every three years. Um, it actually reports three of the biggest risk factors with the Canada Pension Plan. The first one is demographics. The second one is the economy. And the third is immigration. So I think if you go to the next slide, um, I think there might be something there. This one talks to the economy. So the Organization for Economic Collaboration and uh, Development, OECD, um, they monitor 39 countries, or sorry, they have 39 country member countries, and then they monitor an additional eight or nine countries uh, on top of that. So about 47 countries in total. And they have actually stated that Canada will be the worst performing advanced economy, not only for this decade, but all the way through to the year 2060. Like wow. that is astronomical. And, and what's that, you know, we don't have to get into the minutia of this report, but what, what are the main points of how they, how they determine this? So they're looking at productivity, right? So if you look down there at the bottom, it says labor productivity, it says labor utilization and potential GDP per capita. So GDP per capita right now is all over the news. Right, because the federal government has been boasting about how uh, well the economy, Canadian economy, is doing, and they use GDP uh, to justify that statement. But the reality is, it's not only about productivity of the country. Like you can increase the productivity of the country, but what we have done in Canada is we've added 1.2 million people to our population. So what we want to be measuring is that GDP per capita on an individual basis, are people's lives improving, their standard of living improving, or are their standards of living, you know, decreasing? And what, if you look at GDP per capita, it will tell you about the financial wellness of the individuals living in the country. And right now, if you look at Canada, it is worsening substantially to the point. So um, I'll give you a quote here. The Financial Post actually did a article a few weeks back. This is probably a little bit uh, about a month ago now. And it's a standard of living at a standstill. And it talks about a population trap. So we are bringing so many people into the country that all the available savings are needed to maintain just the existing capital labor ratio. So what that means is that there is no chance of improving or increasing the living standards. And so, that's we, we, so yeah, that well, that's terrifying. Um, when was this report released? So the population trap, that was done by the Financial Post. You can uh, Google it. And I think that was about a month ago. But just recently, just to make matters worse, just recently you have the Bank of Canada, the Deputy Governor um, Carolyn Rogers, who she's actually come out and said that Canada is in a productivity emergency. We are in a crisis. And I think what she said was um, Bank of Canada issues a stark warning about the country's weak labor productivity and low levels of business investment. So we are seeing like GDP growth in the past decade is the weakest since we've seen it in the 1930s. Wow. And so based on the federal government's um, policy of, well, really, it's not just the federal government, it's it's the Alberta government as well. I mean, Danielle Smith wants to increase immigration in Alberta, will double it. And she sees the immigration not just coming from Canada, but also internationally as well. Um, so these 
these governments are bringing these people into our province, into our country. Um, how how is it though? How is this related to uh, the diminishing return of the CPP? Like you would, is it is it true then that the people who have not paid into the CPP will never benefit from that, or does it matter because they're taking these funds from? something different anyway in order to fund it well i mean the thing is there's only so many dollars to go around right and we've already determined that the canada pension plan is a tax right so every dollar the government takes from you is a dollar less that you have to put in your pocket or to do something else with to consume in some other way so the problem is um we need to increase productivity because that's the only way to improve our standard of living, right? I mean, the government is taking more and more. The government is getting bigger and bigger. And you have to remember, yeah. the government is not productive. Everybody likes to think that, oh, you know, a big government is a good thing. A big government is a very dangerous thing for the economy because it does not contribute to the economy. It is a drain on the economy, not a contributor to the economy. Well, and, you know, oh, and this is... This is the other thing, too. A lot of people, you know, talk about, you know, the government is creating jobs and or should be creating jobs. and But it's not at all the government's role or responsibility to create jobs. Right. Um, and we've we have this again. This is this is kind of where we are as a population and where I've seen a, a major disconnect in in our relation, an individual's relationship with our government, thinking that you know, they, they are our parents, essentially, that they're going to provide for us, and that we have to live by their rules. And, and, and as a result, we're going to just take whatever it is that they offer us, whether that's increasing in our taxes, or, or diminish, diminishing services, or whatever, or increasing government. But, you know, I do see that in government is increasing, 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 even conservative, so called conservative governments are increasing their, their governments and taxes. So, you know, go ahead, like, I, I just find that um, this I, because immigration to me is, is a really big hot button. And I think not only from an economic standpoint, but it's totally changing the social, well, it's part of what's changing the social fabric of our society as well. But, um, you know, a, a couple of things there. So, I mean, if you look at things from an economic standpoint, um, adding more people like mass immigration doesn't work. That's compounding the problems that we already have. Um, the problem that you're seeing, I, I love when people look at me and they say, well, the government should do something about that. The governments don't, you don't want the governments to do something about that. So the bigger the government becomes, and every time the government, people go, oh, the government's funding this, the government's funding that. No, the government's not funding it. You are. You are funding it. You, the taxpayer. Well, and that's, and that's just it. You know, when, when these governments- that of, of productive money in the private sector that would be earning more dollars and put to work, right? But the government doesn't produce anything. So the bigger the government becomes, the less productive individuals become. Now, if you take 1.2 million um, immigrants that come into the country, and, and now we're seeing, you know, inflation, we, we're seeing strains on the healthcare system, we're seeing strains on education, we're seeing strains on yeah. housing is a perfect example of that. Now, immigration is not the only cause of that. Um, again, productivity would fix much of this. Like the reason people uh, in Canada and other countries rebounded so quickly after the world wars, for example, was because productivity just kicked into high gear. There was innovation, there was creativity. Um, the private sector just got into, you know, R and D, um, all of these things at that, that fuel an economy from a productive standpoint, just kicked into high gear. We have a federal government today that is basically anti productivity. Every policy they have come up with, including rejecting LNG exports to three countries now, um, yeah. just goes to prove my point. There is nothing about them that they under that indicate to me that they understand the problem. They are the problem. And now that you're trying to put these Band-Aid fixes uh, by buying votes, for example, we're going to build more houses. Well, the government can't build more houses. It's using taxpayer dollars. So where is the taxpayer dollar coming from? It's coming from somebody who's actually out in the private sector having to earn it. 
that's where the productivity comes. So the government, the best thing the government can do here is get rid of your regulations, downsize, restricted size, restricted, um, you know, uh, ability to function um, and get out of the way. Let the private sector come in, take over, do what it does best, and that's innovate, create and produce. 100%. I agree with you. So we have Warren here who asks, do immigrants need to contribute and do they, sorry, do they qualify for full benefits upon retirement? Yeah. So do you know the answer once, to that? Yeah. So once you've contributed uh, to the Canada Pension Plan, then you do and are eligible to receive benefits. So your benefits are tied to how much you contribute and for how long. So that is, uh, if no. you don't contribute, you don't get anything. But if you do come and you're put to work. So this is the immigration issue. The immigration issue needs to be one of, of quality, not quantity. We want high income earners, young people who are coming here, um, you know, that are going to start the family. We need to limit the number of refugees. We need to limit the number of grandparents and parents that are coming to the country because they're not contributing, right? They then yeah. become a benefactor to all the services, but not having contributed anything to it. So when you're looking at immigration, and I think Maxime Bernier and the People's Party of Canada and their policy, we talked about this back in 2018. We saw foresaw the problem before anybody else did. Um, and that was, you needed to limit the number of, of immigrants. And you hit the nail on the head, Catherine, with Danielle Smith is now going around telling people that she wants 10 million people in Alberta by in 20 years. Well, holy moly, that's like doubling the amount of immigration that Canada as a whole is bringing in. And we've seen the catastrophe and the mess that's created. And yeah. what she will end up doing is completely wiping out any Western heritage and any Albertan true like Western values, because these people are not going to be coming um, necessarily. We, they're not going to be Albertans born and raised here. They're going to be well, exactly to like in Canada and, 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 who don't share I, our values. Well, and I don't understand this policy, right? I mean, we have. I mean, I mean, this is a different topic, but I think it's something that I, we should be touching on at some point. If not today, then at another time. But you know, our birth rate um, has gone down, and and so the the answer the answer has been, okay, well, we want to just increase immigration, right? And that's part of, that's one of the solutions, right? But you don't hear a government talking about the solutions about why our birth rate's going down. And, you know, and this is more of a, this is very political, but, you know, it's about this feminist movement. It's about the degradation of traditional families. Um, so basically we have this conservative government in name only enacting socialist policies is really what it comes down to. And so, you know, and, and these governments are going, you know, left of center, they're moving left of center all the time. And you're completely bang on Nadine with respect to uh, eroding our, our Western traditional um, Alberta values. And it's just going to get worse. But I mean, that was the that, you know, what I know now about the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is that that was the entire plan the entire time um that was the plan the entire time when you the whole the whole reason behind the charter of rights and freedoms and how it's interpreted it's actually uh it's interpreted under a multicultural lens and so you know i i remember in the 80s and you know i was little i was only like you know it was just five or six or seven you know i remember them throwing around these buzzwords like multiculturalism and all this stuff and i and, and i just even then it was a word that I didn't quite understand, but that, that has completely transformed and is transforming the zeitgeist of Canadian history and values and morals. And so anyway, I'm getting off track and, and I have a tendency to do that, but okay. um, on, on the birth rate topic, it's a really good one because I mean, just if you look at the economics and the costs associated with having children, it's very expensive to have kids today. Yeah. Um, you know, whether that's by design or not, you know, you can have that debate. But the reality is, um, you know, it is very expensive to have kids. And I mean, right now we're seeing affordability crisis across the board. Food is going up. Fuel is going up. Energy is going up. Housing is unaffordable for most uh, Canadians now. I mean, you know, and, and even if you look at the housing plan that, that Trudeau put forward, 
um, he's talking fourplexes. So instead of saying, hey, let's increase productivity, let's raise wages, um, let's get people out and working in better jobs with higher pay, increasing productivity, what he said is, is no, we need to lower your expectations. You're not going to own a single family home. You're going to mm-hmm. own a fourplex. You know, a well, one and that's home. by design too, right? And, right. and and that's by design too with the 15 minute cities and yeah. and this idea to urbanize the landscape as well. I mean, one of the reasons why my husband and I moved out to rural Alberta was one peace and quiet in, in Calgary is transformed into a city that I no longer recognize having grown up there my entire life. Um, but in any event, it's affordable or a lot more affordable than it is in Calgary. And I mean, my daughter is going to be graduating next year from high school. Not only do I not want her to go to university to become a, a, a woke tard, but um, apart from that, I there's no value in it. It's it's I don't see the value um, in the degree in the degree anymore. Um, well, and and, the, cert- and have, certainly the education. Yeah, there's probably far more value to be had in the trades right now. If you're just looking yeah. at a street economic perspective, they're the ones that are out there doing the work, um, you know, with the small businesses or working for themselves or other people that are making the money. They're the, they're, that's where the production is. And it's funny, we've spent generations upon generations, decades, telling kids to go to university so they could get a good job. Yeah. And the reality is they're coming out of university and can't get a job. Um, It's the trades that are lacking. But, you know, coming back again to the economics. And so, you know, Canada is going to be one of the worst performers. But yet Alberta is a very different picture altogether. So if you look at the GDP per capita or income per capita on an international basis, Alberta ranks up as the number third spot just behind Ireland and Norway. So Alberta has an extremely strong, powerful uh, ec- economy. We are the economic engine of Canada and, and right up there with like literally the top countries in the world as this little province of just, you know, 4.5 million people. So, you know, from an economic standpoint, Alberta is set to far exceed and will far exceed anything that you can expect to see out of Canada. So if you look at the economy being a huge risk factor to the Canada pension plan, um, Alberta is will far outperform on its own. And one of the other things is when we, we've talked already a little bit about immigration and how, you know, the, the federal policies have just made a mess of that. Alberta has to be careful to make sure that they don't make a mess of the same. Um, because mm. you certainly can. You can't bring 10 million people into this province in 20 years. It's just, it it's not sustainable. Um, we would just end up with worse problems than what we already have. Um, and and then I'm, you know, immigration is, is you need it. We need it because we do have a, a, a low birth rate, um, but it has to be controlled. Um, and it, we have to be able to absorb the people that come in and they have to integrate into society. But then in addition to that, um, if you bring up the, the Little Newfoundland and Labrador's Employers con- Council, that one. That one? I, I'd like to talk to this and I, I found this just recently um, because this whole concept of the increasing contributions and or reducing benefits um, you know, to the Canada Pension Plan as a fix, you know, this is why they made the changes in 1997. And the reality is Newfoundland and Labrador actually hit the nail on the head here because this was done in 2010. And I have already talked a little bit about unforeseen consequences. Economic policy, sometimes they get it implemented, but sometimes it may take years, if not decades, for the consequence of that bad policy to actually filter through into something that people can see, touch and feel. And by that time, people are going, I have no idea why yeah, like, it's happening. Like net I, zero and carbon capture. Absolutely. Well, I mean, so you, <laughs> you know, you'll have to go back you know, 10, 15, 20 years to look at the policy that created the the symptoms, the, the, the hurt, the pain, the suffering that people are feeling today. And the CPP is no different. So if you look at this, this uh, article that the Newfoundland Labrador Employers Council put out, they voted against this in 1997. And one of the reason being is I love the bottom, 
premium increases will not result in any noteworthy benefit increase in the near future. Employers should not have to endure another increase in CPP premiums due to government's mismanagement of the CPP system. And they point out the fact here that it will actually cause um, inflation. It will cause an increase in demand or increase in um, uh, costs because what ends up happening is, is you have to pay a dollar more to the government. Now, you're as a small business owner, you have to recover that dollar. Yeah. So guess who ends up paying more for the service or the good that you have? The consumer. So yeah. driving prices uh, yeah. up. Yeah. So it's the policy yeah. that causes the problem. Right. Yeah. It's inflation is not a, res, you know, uh, the fact that prices go up. That's that's the result of inflation. Inflation happens usually when government prints more money and it happens when prices, you know, like economic policy like this puts pressure on small business and causes it to have to reduce productivity. Right. And that's one less dollar that they have to put back into the economy. So the end result, I love this because this is the end result, increasing CPP premiums, increase inflation, result in job losses for Canadians. Premiums for both employers and employees have already increased by 75 percent since the late 1990s with no corresponding increase in benefits. And that's exactly what we're seeing today. So you've got the next generation that is going to pay through their teeth in higher and higher taxes to basically receive substandard benefits with no real uh, increase in, in the benefit that, you know, okay, previous so, have been party to. Okay, well, this is interesting. So why would we want to have any pension plan? Well, I already showed you in the beginning, um, we probably wouldn't. Um, this is something the government, in my opinion, should never have done. Um, and it should be wound back and wound down. Um, if the government truly was looking out for the interests of the people, what they would have done was said, OK, we need a mandatory savings plan. So let's take 10 percent or whatever it is that you of your income. And maybe that gets put into an individual pension plan. And then at least the, the first slide we saw with the one point three million dollars, that's yours. You're responsible for your retirement then and managing your money and, and the best to your Ooh, ability. You know what? I think you hit the nail on the head, um, Nadine, uh, and it's responsibility. And this is yeah. something, okay, this is why, this is part of why I've created this podcast or and have this, uh, you know, uh, real affinity for this notion of responsibility. I don't think people want, like, I, I don't know. I want to, my job here is going to be to, to encourage people to take personal responsibility, right? And to to shift their mindset uh, from trusting the government, thinking the government is going to tell them all levels of government are here to dictate our, our, our everyday lives and our um, economic prospects. But really the, the, I don't, even though, even, even if people didn't want to invest, that's their choice and that should be their choice. I mean, it, as you said, this is another tax it, it it it's not being managed well. Um, probably no government will be able to manage it well to the expectations of uh, uh, of an individual, uh, at least somebody who's knowledgeable in this area and and has some sort of um, understanding of what they're doing. But um, you know, you're you're making a, some really good points here about why would we even want to do this whatsoever? I mean. Yeah. So, and, and uh, I mean, in my own personal opinion, you wouldn't want the government to do this at all. The reality is, though, is the only way for Alberta to get out of the Canada Pension Plan is to establish its own like or similar pension plan. And unfortunately, that is the cards that we've been dealt. So we obviously have to deal with those. We can't change what we don't own and we can't change what we don't control. And we certainly don't own or control the Canada pension plan. So at least what we can hope to do by bringing it home is take away a little bit more of the pain and the suffering, maybe through lower contribution rates. Um, maybe we can increase the number of benefits and or if we did nothing and left it exactly the same, 
maybe we can fully fund it and give people more control over their own financial retirement um, and give them, you know, a better uh, financial security to know that A, it will be there for them and their children, but B, also that there's greater benefits um, to the next generations that'll Call, you know, that are going to be called upon to fund it. So, you know, it, it, I just, it breaks my heart. I have a six-year-old. I know you just have a young uh, person at home too. That's just about getting ready to graduate high yeah. school, I believe. And I mean, it breaks my heart to think that they are going to have a lower standard of living than what we have enjoyed. They're going to pay significantly higher taxes just about on every front from a carbon tax to a payroll tax called the CPP or an APP, um, you know, whatever we can do to lighten the load and to fix the problems, I think we all need to get actively engaged and involved um, and don't dismiss it. You know, it's people are, are running around public employees in particular, um, and a lot of the NDP are saying, oh, you know, don't touch my pension plan. But the reality is, is that the majority of public service workers, 96% of them will get a public pension plan. Yeah. You know, and so it's it's the self-employed and the private sector and the higher income employees, um, you know, like in Alberta in particular, that are really the ones that are being punished the most and severely with this this Canada pension plan. I had mentioned earlier that the CPP has an enhanced um, now, like so from sixty eight thousand five hundred dollars to seventy three thousand two hundred this year to $73,200 to $78,000 next year. That's an additional 4%. Well, Alberta has the highest incomes in the province. So we have the youngest workers, right? Here's the demographics. We have the youngest workers. We have, we work more. So we have the highest productivity and we have the highest incomes. You don't think that the government didn't realize that Alberta has the highest incomes when it set the enhanced CPP the additional tax on the highest income earners who suffers most Albertans. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so yeah. you know, oh, yeah. that yeah. type of stuff that for me, I just find so incredibly dishonest and, you know, well, that, it, it, you know, this is this, this is just one more reason and, and a really good reason why I'm such a proponent of um, leaving Canada, leaving the Confederation of Canada and, and um, being our own independent nation. I think that we would be much better off on many fronts, but this is, this is one really good reason that you, that you're highlighting. Yeah. Well, I mean, in my opinion, if Quebec has it, Alberta should have it. And if Quebec can do it, Alberta can do it better, in my opinion. Um, you know, it, so Quebec has- Well, assuming, assume we don't- own. Um, pension plan. It has its own um, health transfer. It has its own immigration policies. Those are yeah. all things that Alberta should have. And we have the ability. It's already within our provincial jurisdiction to do those things. And we need to have that autonomy, right? We need so to put why, between us and, and Ottawa. So why do you think, why do you think uh, Smith elected to, you know, create this hype? Was she just testing the waters, throwing this this uh, report out there, seeing what the reaction of Albertans was going to be, or do you think she should have just legislated it? Like, she should have started just the process. It. Um, I, I think right now, and I'm drafting, um, working with some others to draft some policies, some resolution for the AGM, and one of them is around the APP um, repeal Bill Two. We don't need a referendum. Why would you constrain um, the 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 judicial? or the jurisdictional powers that you already have by placing additional restrictions on it. Like there's no need to do that. So, I mean, yeah. this is something that, you know, she never had to, to go to referendum. And in my opinion, she should never have put it to a referendum. Um, it is absolutely one of the best things that we could do for every single Albertan in this province would be the benefactor of this. And there was no yeah. reason to have to stay. And what's really interesting right now that you bring up, um, and this is where uh, I'll, prove my non-bias to the federal or provincial government is that, you know, Jason Nixon is now in small groups said that, oh, when Pierre Polyev gets elected federally, the Alberta pension plan is going to go away. And I'm like, no, it's not going to go away. Um, and nor should Albertans let it go away. Um, so that's one of my concerns that Pierre Polyev does get in, in the federal election. And then 
Albertans get apathetic and go back to sleep thinking everything's okay. Well, how long do you yeah. think Pierre Polyev is going to be there for? Four years? Eight years? Well, I mean, Parker was there. Nothing changed for Alberta. Actually, things got worse. Yeah. You know? Well, and that's and that's the illusion, right? And that's and that's still the illusion of choice that that the federal conservative uh, government is going to be any better. I mean, we've seen no indication, um, uh, you know, other than his catchy ca um, um, phrases like "axe the tax." I mean, he still intends on staying with um, fulfilling the obligations of the Paris Climate Accord. And I've seen no indication from the federal government or from the CPC party, uh, Conservative Party of Canada, that they intend to reverse any of the policies that Stephen Harper signed us on to, which are actually causing um, the havoc that they are causing in, for Canadians right now from healthcare to, to environmental issues, right? Because there is no environmental issue and, and we're under this, you know, delusion that there is. So, but anyway, let's get back to the Canada, the CPP, APP, because I want to make sure that you're able to get all of your information out there. And, um, and do you want to get back to the slides? Sure. So, well, I'll just finish up on the demographics one yeah. because we've already kind of touched on it. And the reality is, is that Canada has a shrinking population, like a, a declining birth rate. So, I mean, in the 1950s, there was 27.1 live births. In 1972, there was 15.6. And in 2023, 9.1. Like that's substantially um, you know, just a massive decrease. And so in 1970, you know, like the Canada Pension Plan came into play into 1966. In 1972, there were 7.8 workers for every one person retired. Today, there are 3.4 and come 2050, it'll only be 2.4. So, I mean, again, we just don't have the population to support these types of um, uh, programs. And again, in 1950, when, uh, you know, you they were looking at the data on starting a Canada pension plan, you know, the average life expectancy was 68 years old. So you weren't expected to live much longer after the time that you uh, started receiving your pension plan. By 1972, that was 72 years of age. So, you know, you had to plan for, you know, seven, eight years. Now it's 83. That's 18 years. You know, so, the, you know, People are living longer, having to support them longer, and we got fewer and fewer people to do that with. So demographically, though, Alberta is the exact opposite. We have, for every $1 that we give to the Canada Pension Plan, only 64 cents of it comes back to support our own retirees. The other 36%, other 36 cents gets invested as surplus with the Canada Pension Plan. So, I mean, 3 to $5 billion each and every year, Alberta could save and keep at home here in Alberta to the benefit of Albertans one way or the other, um, just by doing our own Alberta pension plan and not giving it to the Canada pension plan. Hmm. Good. Yeah. Great, great, great points. Do you want, should we go along to the next slide? Sure. Okay. So we've already talked a little bit about come 2026, the expenditures are going to exceed the contributions. We don't have enough people working and contributing to be able to finance and fund the actual retirees. Um, but what we haven't talked about is the unfunded liabilities. And for a lot of people, they don't really understand what an unfunded liability. So the best way I've been able to explain it is you have a house. Your house is worth, let's say, $3 million. You have a beautiful, fancy mansion. Um, but you have a mortgage on it of $12 million. The unfunded liability is $9 million, right? So everybody sees the Canada Pension Plan and they go, oh, they're, they like to boast about the $590 billion they have in assets. But what they don't tell you is they have $1.14 trillion in <laughs> unfunded liabilities. And that number has only gotten worse. And that 1.14 trillion, that was as of December 31st, uh, 2021. That's up from 884 billion in 2019. And it'll be very interesting to see how that will exponentially explode when they have to start dipping into the assets 
just to pay for retirees as the contributions are no longer going to uh, meet the needs of the expenditures. So um, that it, watch for that one. And, and unfunded liabilities are probably the number one thing that have destroyed more defined benefit plans than anything else. Wow. So, and how, and how are we, like, how does that situation here, um, these um, unfunded liabilities, how does this re rectify itself? Like, yeah, is there's it only possible? One, one of three ways. You have to reduce the people who are benefiting. Uh, it's called MAID. Um, are you depressed, <laughs> Catherine? <laughs> we have a solution for that now. Um, so you okay, that is not funny, but it is. I was not expecting that. <laughs> you know, but that's the truth. So we we can reduce the number of people who are uh, benefiting. We can increase the contributions, which is what they have been doing, and they will have to continue to continue to do that um, because we do not have, like I said, come twenty twenty six, we don't have yeah. the uh, contributions. And or they have to increase immigration, the number of people who are contributing. And we've seen the mess that that's created. So, you know, there is no easy fix to this. We basically it's a social benefit program that we can't afford. They're just going to continue to un, uh, roll, you know, just ring up those unfunded liabilities. And they're, they're politicians. They're only going to worry about getting reelected. They're going to try and not have this discussion and they'll just kick the can down the road for the next government to have to deal with. And really that, like I said, that's going to be the taxpayer. So taxpayers are really the ones that are going to have to wake up to the reality that this is a program that we can't afford. It is not sustainable long-term um, and it needs to be fixed. There are ways to fix it. They're not going to be pleasant, but it means that we have to stop digging a hole first um, and then start looking at ways to start filling in the hole. That's going to take time. It's not something you'd want to do overnight, but there are ways that you it can be done. And Alberta yeah. has has the best opportunity of any province to make that happen. Well, it would be amazing if um, if uh, people were in government that actually didn't, you know, had the the citizens best interest in mind and not re-election. I mean, I see that it is very obvious to me what drives our political class right now. And uh, it's just unfortunate. So let's get on, go on to this, um, the next slide here. Sure. So this one here, LifeWorks, we already talked about who LifeWorks was. That was Bill Marno's company. It's an actual actuary. Um, and um, people have been disputing like the numbers and everything else. And where did these numbers come from? How did you get to 53%, $334 billion? Well, the reality is that actually came from the Canada Pension Plan Act itself. Um, Section 113.2a is very clear in how it defines if a province decides to leave, what assets it's entitled to take with it. Well, you take all the money that the province, not individuals, because I love this. People go, oh, well, it's impossible to have over contributed to the Canada Pension Plan because the formula is the same for each and every individual. Yes, it is. But it is provincial jurisdiction. And it is the provinces that signed on to this. And so if it is, it is the provinces that would leave, right? So if one province like Alberta has been disproportionately contributing because we have higher incomes, we work more and we're younger and we don't have as many retirees, well, then that creates a surplus for that province. And that's really what the discussion is about. So contributions, less any benefits that have been paid out, less any administrative costs, plus any investment returns on any surpluses that you would have earned. Now, you've got people like uh, Trevor Tome, for example, professor of uh, economics at UFC. He's got a slightly different interpretation about how this could be interpreted. And, you know, he said that the number could be as low as 120 to $150 billion. And I'm like, okay, fine, we'll tackle that in a moment. But let's talk about the intention. Ontario Premier, John Robart, in 1966, when the Canada Pension Plan was put into place, he wanted to protect the interests of Ontario should they decide at any point in the future they wanted to leave the Canada Pension Plan. His comment, quote, to be placed in precisely 
the same financial position as if this province had operated in identical but separate plan from the outset. So I think it is very clear in the language used here um, to, you know, eradicate any doubt that that was the intention. Contributions, less the benefits, plus whatever returns, less the administrative costs. And that is done on a provincial basis as if the province had established its own plan. So yeah. I, I think that's really important for people to understand because people have been really quabbling over about the $334 billion, which I'm going to show you in the next slide. We actually don't need any of it. Um, okay, well, the next slide talks about pension fund. I'll, talk, I'll come back to that in a moment. Okay. Pension do you want me to go funds, back to seven? No, no that's okay. okay. So the pension okay, okay, funds... Okay. Uh, the Canada Pension Fund has $590 billion in assets under management, but it has 22 million people that it has to pay that out to, right? It still has the pay as you go, and that 590 represents the surplus, but that surplus goes away in 2026. We've already, you know, identified that. So that $590 billion, forget the unfunded liabilities. 22 million people, that's you're each got $28,818 per member, right? The Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, just as a, a contrast to that, is $250 billion, but it's only 336,000 members. That's $744,000 per member. That's a wow. fully funded pension plan. As you can see, the, the Canada Pension Plan is still very much a pay as you go. Yeah, yeah, right? 100%. Yeah, right. Yeah. But if we very... started in Alberta, we could start from nothing. So the number is going to be disputed. It is going to take some years uh, in court, I suspect, before we settle on a number with the federal government. Why? Because they have no reason to let Alberta go. They do not want the game to be called, right? They don't want this out in the, the public. They don't want people to know. But if we started tomorrow with nothing, and we can, because we can do the same pay as you go. Remember, I said already, for every dollar, only 64 cents that's going to CPP today is going to pay for Alberta retirees. So we could have a lot more retirees here in Alberta and they would still continue to get their pension without a doubt. Yeah. In 30 years at just a 6% rate of return, that's $337 billion. But the reality is that within the next two, three, maybe five years, let's say on the long end of that, we received just $120 billion. Just 120 on the low end, like Trevor Thomas said, they've gone with the, his interpretation. Alberta says, fine, whatever, just give us some money. We're going to get out of here. We're done with it. $120 billion. Now, if you go to the next slide, okay, if we left on. with that $120 billion, we only have 2.25 million contributors right now, right? That is $53,000 per member. So we are twice as rich with an Alberta pension plan with $120 billion that we receive in our own assets as we would have been with the Canada pension plan. So let's right. and so, let go me ahead, finish go this ahead. and then ask you a question. Yeah. So if we yeah. changed nothing, nothing, we kept the contribution rates the same, we kept the benefits the same, we kept everything the same, we changed nothing. Let's go through the 30 year cycle. We kept investing our surplus, right? Um, 10 years, 113,000 per member. 20 years, 220,000 per member. In 30 years, when let's say our 30 year old, 35 year old is today, he's been contributing, right, to the Alberta pension yeah. plan. Now yeah. he goes to retire at 65. He's got a pension per member that's worth 412,000 per person. There's a far greater financial security in this model that is completely doable than staying with the Canada Pension Plan. And this is changing nothing. Same benefits, same contributions, same everything. So so the big the big, you know, boogeyman question out there is, well, you know, the UCP is going to completely mismanage it and blah, blah, blah. Right. Like, I mean, I don't know what government is going to manage it properly anyway, but. Sue me, like, 
how how are you dealing with that criticism? Well, that's assuming that the Canada Pension Plan Investing Board hasn't mismanaged anything. Right, right? Exactly. Everybody, exactly. Everybody likes to look at, at rate of return, but there's not just about rate of return. It's also about uh, the decisions that are made and how you mitigate risk. Investing, the successful investors in the world are not the ones that take um, that get the highest returns. They're the ones that take uh, calculated risk, right? The reward has to balance the risk that you're taking, right? You don't want to put everything on, you know, play Russian roulette, right? It's like, how many times do you want to, you know, roll that little trigger and, and pull it before, you know, your number is up, right? So, I mean, and is the risk worth the reward, right? So investing, good investors look at risk, and that's probably what they look the most at. You know, that's what I look at the most. It's not about the reward. It's about what kind of risk do I have to assume for the potential of a reward, right? And so, and so you... Do you see that there's measures that you could integrate that you would recommend the government integrate to safeguard to to give people a level of comfort that uh, like some oversight or how how are you what do you think their solution is for that? Absolutely. So there needs to be a truly independent board. People think that the Canada Pension Plan is independent. It is not independent. Um, it is right now. Um, every director is appointed by the Minister of Finance. And to a certain extent, you are gonna have some government involvement. It will be impossible. It's a government pension plan to have them completely out of the picture because they do have to establish the infrastructure and the framework, right? But establish the infrastructure, establish the framework, establish the objective, maximize the return, right? With the mitigate as much risk as possible and then get out of the way, right? Let the um, an independent board manage there needs to be rules put in place for conflict of interest because in uh the canada pension plan i'll just give you an example mark machin was the ceo he was hired um, by the canada pension plan investment board as the day-to-day -day manager to oversee the management his wife and his friend mark evans who found himself on the cppib the board of directors of fought the following year had started a company and Mark Machin, when he was the CEO of CPPIB, well, he allocated or allowed an allocation of $675 million to go to his wife and Mark Evans' company. <laughs> now, whether that's right or wrong, you decide. I just see that as an egregious conflict of interest. Mark yeah. Machin was later let go. Uh, he was he resigned, voluntarily resigned. He should have been let go for cause with a $20 million uh, compensation package from his friend, Mark Evans, who was in charge of, you know, determining what that compensation was going to be. So, I mean, for me, I just look at things like that, that just should never, ever happen. Things yeah. need to be independent. They need to be transparent and they need to be, you need to be held accountable. So yeah, you know, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Wow. So are we, we're almost finished here. Uh, I think this is your last slide. Is it not? Um, it could be. So, I mean, this one here talks about, you know, some of the things that people have mentioned, public concerns, obviously size of the fund, right? Alberta would have a smaller pension to begin with. But size as far as a dollar value is kind of irrelevant. What does matter is access. You want access to the opportunities, right? That's what's really important. And that's what size grants you in investments is the access to the best asset managers that the world and the best opportunities that the world has to offer. That's where size is important. Um, you know, CPP talks about everyone goes, oh, it's the best in the world. Well, that's a matter of perspective, right? If you're just going to evaluate it based upon returns, yeah, it does. It does well. Um, but if you're going to look at sustainability, you're going to look at other factors. You know, the Mercer report is uh, an independent report that's done by the CFA Institute, and they don't even rank uh, the CPP in the top 10. Right. So everything mm -hmm. is a matter of perspective. We already talked about independence. Um, some people seem to think that, you know, we couldn't leave. That's been long time disputed. So the legal aspects of it are, are dealt with. Um, CPPIB is coming to Calgary. One of their big things that they're promoting is portability and the fact that they're global. Well, why would an Alberta pension plan not be portable? Why would an Alberta pension plan not have global assets? Of course it would. 
right? That's just responsible asset management. And anybody who's an asset manager knows that, right? So they would, and again, that's where size comes into play. You know, an Alberta pension plan is sizable enough that you would have access to the best asset managers in the world. Um, you know, they talk about safety of funds. They talk about safety of funds being, well, we have 22 million people and look at all the provinces. Well, I see that as a risk. That's a big risk, you know, with 22 million people and only 590 billion in assets. Well, I'm sorry, that's only 28,000 per person. Mm -hmm. You know, Alberta could double its odds, improve its odds by two times just by starting its own Alberta pension plan, right? And each member is worth 53,000 with just the small end of that 120 billion. So, and then the last one is fairness. And that's where you brought up the Alberta burden, um, that last slide. And the problem with this one is, is people have to decide for themselves what's fair. Um, Alberta has been carrying, um, you know, the rest of Canada for far too long. Um, and, and I mean that, like, and it's not just Newfoundland and Labrador, Nova Scotia and PPI. Those are the obvious ones, but it's been carrying also a greater burden than Ontario and Quebec and, um, you know, other provinces across the board. And is that fair? You know, the CPP is an additional equalization payment to Canada. And I can guarantee you, if you asked people in Alberta, if you said, look, if we could end equalization payments tomorrow, you know, raise your hand who, who would want to do that. I would say there's without a doubt, 80 to 85 percent of Albertans would raise their hand and go, yep, let's get rid of equalization. And well, we yet, already had a referendum well, of such, on it where over 60 percent, I think, voted in favor. Right. And so if you are in favor of ending equalization, you have to be in favor, honestly, of ending the Canada pension plan, withdrawing and establishing an Alberta pension plan, because that's exactly what we are doing. We are sending an additional three to five billion dollars each and every year as another equalization payment. We're just calling it, you know, the contributions to the Canada pension plan. And it's going to fund the rest of Canada's retirees. And so we're doing this at our own detriment. And I'm a big yeah. advocate of, you know what, Alberta, let's stop for taking in our own demise and let's start taking care of our own. And because you know what, we are going to be of no value and no help to anybody else if we go down with the sinking ship, right? Let's get the lifeboat. Let's get engaged. Let's set up our own Alberta pension plan. And at least then we're in a position where we have taken care of ourselves and hopefully the rest of Canada, through innovation and creativity and increasing their own productivity, they all have their own natural talents, their own natural resources. It's time for them to develop them and stop getting off the handouts that Alberta has been feeding it for far too long. 100%. So how how are we going to um, encourage um, Danielle Smith to, how, how are we going to do how are we going to do this? How how can Albertans um, participate in this other than, um, you know, at the ballot box? I mean, there has to be a way that like, are, are there any initiatives other than your, your, you know, this wonderful presentation that you've given tonight? Is there anything else that we can do as Albertans to uh, make sure Smith um, just gets this thing done? Yeah, so we, um, there was an initiative started. Um, I originally was a part of that, still doing a little bit of work, hopefully, on it. Um, there is a petition that is going around, and you can sign that petition that just says we want a referendum on this. And that just really is just going to push the issue to make sure that we do have a referendum. I really don't like the fact that Jason Nixon is already speaking to small groups about the fact that the Alberta pension plan is just going to go away. Um, that that that's irresponsible and you know as as an mla and a cabinet minister he shouldn't be having that conversation um the reality is you know this is one of the best things that albertans can do to help their own circumstances um their families their friends i mean every albertan would benefit from this it needs to happen so you can sign that petition um the other thing is, is if you go to my uh nadinewellwood.ca that's my web page um, you can get more information on the Alberta Pension Plan. I have a little uh, two-page handout that I just I draft, and I use that to give to people at my events, my evenings that I do, my talks, much like this, but in person. Um, drag a friend out, um, you know, and if you go on to finish my webpage, 
If you go on there and you put in your name and your email, you'd be able to download that little two page handout. And it's great for handing to friends or family who are kind of uncertain and you don't know how to start the conversation or, you know, start the conversation around the dinner table uh, with your kids or grandkids. Um, in addition to that, I am doing a meeting here in Cochrane on April 19th at seven o'clock at the Frank Wills Memorial Hall. Um, and that's from seven to nine and bring your questions. You know, if we have missed something, it didn't get answered here tonight. Um, you, you heard the presentation. Now you're convinced and you're confident, but you know, you're going, oh my gosh, my kids got to get out and hear this. And I got to drag my neighbor out and hear this. Um, there's no better way the, to do that than in person. And then you can ask your questions directly of me. If I've missed something, I'm always happy to answer them for you. Well, and I think also you'd be prepared. I, I, and I think this is something like these small to medium sized businesses or, you know, you know, smaller, larger businesses or all, any any business. I mean, this would be a really good uh, lunch and learn yep. to to give to your employees so that they have they have this unbiased, um, you know, information that you, I think that they could benefit from. And I, I, I know that small any business you know, well, is interested in ensuring. I mean, they are the ones who contribute 50% of the uh, payroll tax, right? The Canada pension plan. Exactly. They have, so, they have know, an interest in this. They need to know. They, they need and, to know exactly. Look, if, if you're contributing $4,000 um, for every employee, and let's say you're a small business owner and you've got 30 employees, you know, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars a year that you could save, you know, by working with an Alberta pension plan if, you know, they reduce the contribution rates, for example. Um, you know, so this is very important for businesses in particular to get involved. The other thing is, is, you know, I, you know, I have gone around the province and we are trying to fund this. Um, but there are costs, you know, there's hotel costs, there's, there's gasoline costs, there's, you yeah. know, all these expenses. And then of course, you know, you can only do so much on your own for free. And we've really been supported by the generosity uh, and donations from individuals. And it's an awful time to be asking for donations because look at costs. I mean, carbon tax, energy, housing, everything is so unaffordable. But yeah. you know, this is something that as Albertans, if we want to make this happen, then we are going to be the ones that have to make it happen. So if it's not me, um, if there's somebody else out there that's doing this that you'd prefer to support, then by all means. But your donations is how this is going to happen, you know, to keep going from the next meeting to the next meeting to the next meeting. Um, you know, maybe you can volunteer your time uh, to help out. That's another great way to get involved. But if you can't volunteer time, but you have a little extra money, businesses, I've had a couple of businesses that have made some bigger donations. Why? Because if we can reduce the contributions, um to they can't the El, on an alberta pension plan they stand to save hundreds of thousands of dollars a year so yeah. you know do so what you where can, can where you can where where can people donate nadine so if you go onto my website you can find a donate button there um and that that money goes directly to me and i use every dollar to fund activities like this and to keep moving forward in covering the costs of travel and expenses yeah. Well, um, I just want to thank you very much. You are a very knowledgeable, uh, wonderful presenter, and your passion certainly comes through. I'm cognizant of the time here. If you um, if you've enjoyed this presentation and you think that it would be worthwhile, I highly encourage you get out to one of Nadine's events. Um, I know that there's other people who are um, also having events like yours, um, discussing the merits, risks, uh, benefits of an Alberta pension plan. To me, it's a no-brainer, and and I I really hope you know now is a time for um, Albertans to recognize um, the power that they have, um, and and it's not just about. Uh, the immediate results. It's about the future of our children and our grandchildren and um, anything that we can do to um, help them um, save and, sec and secure their future, their financial future, 
and anything to get under out from under the clutches of Ottawa, I'm 100% in favor of. So um, thank you very much for coming on tonight. I'll leave the last word to you, um, but thank you very much. And I wish you well um, and, and anything I can do to help you, um, please let me know. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for everybody for uh, listening. Um, and if you do have questions, feel free to reach out to me personally. I'm more than happy to answer them. Again, if you can get involved, don't just get involved, stay involved. That's the hard part. Um, you know, I've been doing this now for six years. Catherine, you've been doing this for a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it does, you do get tired and it, 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 there's days when you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can get out of bed to do another day. But, <laughs> you know, I, my motivation is my 12 year old. And I, I tell people, um, you know, what is more important right now than this particular topic? Um, you know, the Canadian economy is not doing well. We've, we've gone through the risks. We've highlighted the advantages, uh, and I'll call it the Alberta advantage. And, um, you know, if we, if we don't do this opportunity now, we will not get another opportunity to do it again. So, you know, for so many reasons, um, you know, if we are going to do this, it needs to be now and we can't take our foot off the gas. We have to keep pushing forward. And we are that means we are going to have to put public pressure on our politicians to make sure that it does happen. But we also need to educate every Albertan to the benefits. And it doesn't matter what political orientation you are. Um, it, it really is irrelevant. We can do this and we can do it better than the Canada Pension Plan. We can do it better than the Quebec Pension Plan. Um, so there's no excuse to, uh, to to push it off or to avoid, um, you know, having the discussion. And uh, I appreciate everything that everybody does. And uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for uh, listening and participating in um, the podcast this evening. So thank you so much. Thanks again, Nadine. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, my next podcast will be um, with actually Frances Whittleson. She's a Calgary a professor who was fired for speaking the truth. That's funny, hey? That's next week. But anyway, thanks everyone for um, tuning in tonight and we'll see you next time. Bye.